increase and aggregates. Uh, but also says that if you have properties, all the materials have properties uh, at nanoscale, and uh, there's some hints about certain properties to look at. Um, the other better definition would have appeared in the novel food regulation, but at the last uh, uh, negotiation stage, it, it, it failed, uh, not because of nanotechnology definition, because of the clone, animal cloning, and now it is undergoing in a reform form uh, through the parliament, the European parliament. Hopefully, we will have uh, uh, some definition there. In the meantime, the European Commission uh, sent, uh, issued a recommendation because all it said was that 1 to 100 nanometer particles and your material is nanomaterial. And industry, who were dealing with micronized materials, they were saying, how many particles do I need in my, nano, in, in my material to call it a nanomaterial? <coughs> Will it be one particle, 0.1%, 1%, where is the threshold? So after a long deliberation, uh, the commission has issued this uh, recommendation. It says 50% of more particles, not in terms of weight, and this is important, this is in terms of particle number distribution, because nanoparticles are so light that even a small fraction will have trillions of particles, and this is important to, to consider. So this the recommendation is meant to be overarching, and it is meant to be adopted by various regulatory frameworks in Europe. So it, this is happening at this moment in time. So this is not adopted in the food regulation at this moment in time, but if it is adopted, then we will see how many existing and new uh, materials come under nanomaterial uh, nano definition and whether some of them will, will, will require revaluation. So uh, it's, 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 it's waiting at this moment in time. And why we need uh, to worry about safety, why we need to worry about regulation, and why, why all these definitions and all that? Well, materials we already know, and all we are doing is downsizing the nano, nano sizing them. So all these properties which are being promised, uh, less use of chemicals, increased surface area, control of better control of uh, material properties, improve, improve dispersions, enhance uptake and viability, fine. But by the same token, when you, when you produce particles at nano size, they can go through biological, mem biological barriers, mem membrane barriers. And the scientific evidence now suggests that if particles are inhaled, they will not stop at the lung barrier. And lung barrier will probably let them go, uh, depending on particles' size and shape. Uh, smaller particles within nano, remember the nano scale is from 1 to 100 nanometer. So smaller nanoparticles within that scale will have better chance of getting out of the lung. And then once they are in systemic circulation, they, will, they might end up in various uh, 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 organs. And there is already uh, evidence in, in literature, published literature, that they can end up in brain and liver and kidney and, and liver and everywhere. Skin application, which is like cosmetics, uh, there is a very good um, body of evidence which says that particles do not migrate down the skin. Apart from the, the top layer of, uh, of our skin is dead cells, and they remain trapped in that, and they do not go down into the skin. Uh, although uh, more, more testing is being done on every other type of particles, but uh, uh, all type of particles, including nanoparticles, they do not go down enough to reach viral cells or the circulatory system. Ingestion uh, by food and drinks, which is the to our topic, is, is another issue altogether. Compared to other two groups, we have uh, gastrointestinal system where, where we have very active digestive system working, which is uh, meant to chop down things. So even if nanoparticles are, are adhering to food particles or bound to food particles, food particles will eventually digest out, and then nanoparticles will be free. So this is an area where we have a, an active machinery working, which will actually try to destroy nanoparticles as well, whether nanoparticles survive, whether they don't survive, whether they are digested themselves, once they are broken down and they don't lose their nanostructure, they are not nanoparticles anymore. They are just like any other thing. So this is where lots of research is, is going on at this moment in time. And I will describe some of that. Um, again, to summarize, the nanoparticle uh, concerns relating their safety is that they may cross uh, membrane barriers and they may reach unintended parts of the body. 
they may show altered biokinetics. Once they are in, the, we know biokinetics of uh, uh, normal chemicals, which is driven by uh, uh, partition between organic phase and aqueous phase, uh, their molecular weight, their, their charge, etc. Uh, particles have different uh, behavior. And one thing that is emerging uh, from literature and studies is that particles, because they have huge surface at a nanoscale, they have huge surface energy, they tend to bind and absorb things on their surface, and especially proteins. And once they are coated with other proteins, once they are in the serum, for example, they get uh, blood, they get uh, serum proteins around them. And some of those proteins are actually allowed in the cells, and this is how these particles hitchhike various mechanisms. And <coughs> once they are in the cells, it appears that unless particles are degradable, um, they, they, they will then disappear. If they are not degradable, then body have very little mechanism to throw them out of the cell. And this is a, a, a source of concern. So in short, the nanoparticles made of soluble or degradable polymers should not raise any special safety concerns. So if they are made of uh, materials which are milk proteins or whatever, as long as they are digested in the gut, and they release their contents there, fair enough, there is nothing to worry about. And probably loss of uh, food structuring uh, at nanoscale will, will fall in that category. Nanoparticles which are made of insoluble or bioperistent materials are really a source of concern because they might end up in the body uh, in, in different non-intended organs and uh, uh, start interfering with the uh, various biological mechanisms. Is there any mechanism for safety assessment? So in, in, in Europe, it, again, I must say that this varies from uh, various jurisdictions. Uh, but the European approach is that uh, to issue definitions, guidance, and put in place pre-market notification uh, and risk assessment authorization and labeling. Everything is in place in regard to that risk assessment on a case-by-case -case basis because there is not enough information to derive principles so that you can put various nanoparticles in the categories and say this category is safe or that category is safe, apart from uh, uh, degradation and, and solubility kind of issues. And then uh, uh, various <coughs> committees have the task to, to issue scientific opinions if the nanoparticles, if material is used in, whether in cosmetics, food, or other, other, other materials. So scientific opinions. Uh, regarding food applications are issued by EFSA, which is European Food Safety Authority, and SCCS, which is Scientific Committee of Consumer Safety for, for non-food applications. Safety assessment, as we know, uh, for chemicals, hazard, exposure, and you put them together, and then you measure this. So if one is missing, for example, if it's not hazardous, it does not matter how much exposure there is, it will not have any risk. If exposure is missing, on the other hand, and material is very, very toxic, it does not matter because there is no exposure to consume. So risk is, so hazard does not necessarily mean a risk. And this is where, where there are several gaps when you start looking at nanoparticle toxicology because they behave very differently. You cannot derive toxicological evidence for normal chemicals and extrapolate them to chemicals because they will, they will not work. It does not work. So effectively, we're talking about new data. And <coughs> you can imagine that new data takes a very long time, very detailed studies. You carry out one study, and it raises another question, and so on and so forth. So at the moment, emphasis is that look at the exposure first. So derive risk assessment from exposure point of view. And if there is no exposure, for example, I mentioned skin, lack of skin penetration. If there is no exposure to consumer, then at least consumer is safe from, 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 from any potential harmful uh, effects. And, and regarding food applications, there are several regulations in place which will require specific um, uh, safety assessment uh, and food information uh, 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 regulation I mentioned, and which actually now says that any uh, food material uh, using nanoparticles, nano, nano sized uh, uh, ingredients will have to name the ingredient and put in bracket nano, so for, 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 for the sake of consumer information. And EFSA has <coughs> issued a detailed guidance how this assessment uh, of nanosciences and nanotechnologies and food and feed chain can be 
can be done, and it, it gives a, a detailed um, uh, account of how and what sort of physical chemical characterization data is needed. And, and I will mention what, what difficulties there are, what sort of exposure assessment data is needed, and what sort of toxicological evaluation is needed. And it gives a structured information where you have uh, 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 ADV data, 90-day rodent study, in vitro tests, starting with immunotoxicity, you know, you know, and it is AIMS test, and macronucleus test, and uh, chromosome regression test. And if there is anything positive, then you will want to uh, for the review and vitro uh, assays in, in the class. It's, it's, it's quite a structured thing. One thing to remember is that nanoparticles pose a number of challenges, and one major challenge is, is how to analyze them in a food matrix. And food, by, 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 uh, uh, by its own nature, is, has particular uh, structure of natural materials, which are of no concern because they are degradable, they are digestible. So as a chemical, there is no problem. There are so many uh, validated analytical methodologies we are very used to, so we can analyze it as a chemical without any problem. As a nanoparticle, there are lots of problems. None of the methods is, at this moment in time, validated for nanoparticles. You can use a combination of methods and, and gather some weight of evidence. You measure even, even particle size distribution, for example, and one method will, will say, yes, 1 to 100 nanometer range, the other one will say no 100 to 200 nanometer range, so which one you believe? So uh, there is, uh, in NAFSA guidance, uh, it, it does give a, a, a way out where you can use a combination of methods and get some sort of uh, weight of evidence. Similarly, when someone is doing uh, uh, toxicological or, or, uh, or physical chemical evaluation, there are so many issues. Unlike uh, uh, chemicals are tested, where you have in vitro system and you put one milligram per liter or something uh, and, and go home and come back next day and, and count how many cells have died and whatever, nanoparticles have agglomerated behavior. They will agglomerate, they will stick to the side, and if you have negative results, that may be because cells never receive the results. So ensuring that uh, those is, is equivalent and then how to extract the dose? Is it particle number? Is it normal milligram per liter, milligram per kilogram? Uh, Weight-based dose, mass-based dose, or is it a, a surface area? Is it a combination of them? At this moment in time, this is being sorted out as well. And bioavailability, biokinetic behavior is very, very different. It cannot be predicted by normal uh, uh, densities, Google 5, or, or, or other uh, principles that, uh, or other uh, models that are available. Um, and again, where do they end up? How, how long they remain in the body? This, this all needs uh, showing. So I will just mention two studies that uh, uh, a large project in, uh, in Europe that was carried out called Nanogenotox. They concentrated on uh, two materials. One is synthetic amorphous silica. And this is something which is in the powdered soups. Uh, and if, you, if this material is, is not good in, uh, dried soups will stick together and form a lump. So to keep them flowing, uh, this uh, uh, silica material is added up in, and also ends up in a variety of flowable uh, things as well. So they carried out quite detailed studies and they found negligible or no tissue distribution of silica. Uh, this is oral administration, by the way, uh, uh, in labs. And, uh, uh, but they did, at high, higher doses, they, they saw some organ organ grade, some indication of this pathological effects in liver and spleen at higher doses, much, much higher doses. And then intravenous uh, uh, administration to avoid uh, to this issue, whether they were absorbed through the gut or not absorbed through the gut, to, to, to eliminate that, they saw a gain silica in the liver and spleen. And they showed that uh, clearance would take a very long time if they ended up in those in those organs. Uh, titanium dioxide, which um, any shiny white, brilliant white uh, food material, uh, uh, very white on uh, icing of the cake or uh, chewing gum coating, etc., has titanium dioxide, again composed of uh, uh, nanoparticles, agglomerated in, in, in the larger, uh, larger uh, clusters. Again, this uh, study was done by uh, Genotox, and uh, oral administration showed that some titanium 
only incidentally detected in liver or spleen, some indication of that in, uh, in lymph nodes and uh, mesenteria. Uh, again, IV administration showed that it was rapidly clear from blood, but uh, uh, liver, spleen, and lungs were the main target. And again, once they end up, they ended up in those uh, organs, they were sort of trapped, and, and, and they would not uh, be cleared uh, very easily. We carried out a specific study for uh, uh, food agency where we had the in vitro uh, system, which was uh, basically uh, a co culture of CAPO2 N cells and, uh, and the CAPO2 and N cell co culture, so just to represent uh, gut epithelium and gut epithelium uh, layer, and also in vivo study in that, where uh, we tried to monitor whether Athenian ducks and nanoparticles would translocate out of uh, GI tract. And where would they go? Would they go to liver, kidney, spleen, heart, brain, or remain in the GI tract? Whether they would be excreted in urine or feces? And we did a time course study as well. Our study found, again, uh, very little evidence that uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles uh, would come out of the gut, um, yeah, both in vivo and in vitro study. And, uh, what we did see was that in some individual animals, it was slightly higher than background reading. And it was as if it was um, an experimental error, but you could not ignore it. When you put in statistical analysis, it did not mean anything. So um, what we concluded was that overall conclusion is that titanium dioxide nanoparticles would not go out of the gut will not end up in any of those uh, uh, organs. But there is a possibility that uh, some particles, very, very, very low particles, below the detection, uh, below quantification, the quantification, might uh, 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 and end up in some animals. So this was the uh, conclusion. Uh, so summary, um, there are lots of prospects for innovation. Uh, it's starts off with the uh, food production, to food uh, processing, to packaging, to all kind of areas that could have an impact, and there is a lot of room for innovation. Um, uh, however, unlike other sectors, uh, for example, cosmetics, most food applications are still at r and state. And this is mainly because there are, which was not anticipated some years ago, but um, there are safety questions. Uh, uh, unless those are answered, uh, uh, at least in Europe there is a free market authorization, these machines will not be allowed to use in food products. Uh, limited but growing products worldwide, and we see many, many examples of these, mainly outside Europe, and I should say probably exclusively outside Europe, about one or two packaging applications here. Uh, regulatory definition, how it, is, how it works out in clarity, uh, which of new or existing <coughs> additives can be regarded as nanomaterials. It may be that some of the existing uh, ingredients which are now regarded as micronized will end up in this definition, and hence their safety will be evaluated. Uh, new challenges in relation to material characterization, toxicological evaluation, exposure assessment, uh, risk assessment, all those areas are not easy to, to address. They are not like chemical, uh, you cannot simply take an assay which we use for chemicals and say, are oh, we using um, uh, uh, OECD method 401 or whatever, and are, are you used for nanoparticles? I will give you one example. Uh, silica and some other materials are, are regarded as soluble. Uh, and again, the, the method used is OECD standard method for chemicals. And if you have sugar or salt or something, you take a certain amount, you put that in water, you shake it a certain amount of uh, length of time, and, and you see whether the material has disappeared, it does not sediment, and you say this is soluble. Same thing happens with nanoparticles. You put silica, you put other, a few other nanoparticles, they will disappear from ice, clear solution, and you say this is soluble. You look at the electron microscope, and all the particles are, are, are hanging around. So it is full of nanoparticles. So uh, standard method developed for nanoparticles, uh, sorry, normal chemicals will not work straight away. So there are certain additional things that one would have to do to, 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 to uh, determine their properties and, and behavior. 
Safety concerns are mainly, and again I will emphasize, are mainly poorly soluble or insoluble and bioperistent nanoparticles. If materials that are nanostructured and they are digested, they are broken down in the gut, they do not uh, end up in the systemic circulation, they are of no concern. Because the moment they lose their nanostructure, they are no more nanoparticles, they are like normal chemicals. And again, to reassure that uh, regulatory frameworks are in place and products will have to go uh, uh, through uh, uh, safety evaluation of uh, digestion here. So just to complete that, uh, we have published uh, quite a lot on this uh, uh, subject. The top one is a review of 2008, and then uh, there are two further reviews. Uh, we have uh, also published a, uh, a book on this issue, which uh, summarizes uh, much of the issues around. And very recently, uh, this uh, review article, which is free downloadable, you can download it. Uh, what are the guiding principles for the regulatory evaluation of uh, nano pesticides, which is another emerging area which we will hopefully or probably see in the future. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. but it is already helping in slaughterhouses where you can apply nano coating and uh, it will keep uh, surfaces hygienic and clean. Um, Effectively what I mean is, yes. is we're not able to use less meat to keep it safe in case. I'm not sure about that. I think various uh, uh, companies are already trying that, probably putting <laughs> Uh, not meat and uh, not enough meat and putting uh, other stuff in. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Using some ingredients. Uh, uh, the answer is that if you have certain flavors, you can uh, probably enhance their uh, their activity by putting less by nanostructuring them. But I'm not sure about uh, nanostructuring meat, whether that will increase. Uh, because I think consumers will not only go with the taste attributes, they will also look at the quantity as well, uh, in my view, especially in a burger, how, 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 how thick it is.